Um, I've seen a lot of people fucking talk about it, so I really want to check it out and kind of, you know, see what this whole thing is saying because this might be a cool little thing to see in terms of some of the stuff that I want to check out here on this fucking channel. So let's check this out, actually. This is courtesy of the channel called Hog. Um, it's called What's Inside the World's Most Exclusive Club. It's a pretty cool video, it looks like, by the sounds of it. It's already got over 700,000 views, so clearly I'm not the only one that's that infatuated with Bergan. So if you want more information and insight of what Bergan's about, definitely check this out. Um, the blurb says... This is a video on the design of Bergheim. Thank you, Andreas, for your help and modeling it. So let's see what this says. And maybe this might bring back some memories of my time hanging out in Bergheim, all the fun times I've had there over the last few years. Let's see Wagwan. Let's see Wagwan. In Berlin, there is a building, a building few enter, but many try. It is the hardest club to access on the planet. Yes, it is. Hundreds of people are rejected in a night. You know what's funny? I've only been rejected once in my whole entire time of going burger. And this is many, many, many years. I'm not going to tell you the exact day I started going there because it would date me. But many years of going to burger, I've only been rejected once. And the one time I got rejected is when I went with the lads. When I was going, when I was with the lads, 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 one time I got rejected. When I was really fucked with all the lads and we got all rejected. And for some reason, we were so fucked up. We thought it would be smart if we went around the corner and just swapped jackets. <laughs> Do you hear that? We all got rejected, all of us British lads, all of us London guys, super loud, super boisterous, super annoying. We go, we obviously get rejected, not tonight, right? We get a not tonight. We go around the corner and we think of a great idea of swapping jackets and then going back. The guy was like, obviously I remember who you like, what? Like... <laughs> No, it was fucking hilarious. But yeah, that's the only time I got rejected. Every time I've been there, I've always been lucky enough to get in. So thank you for the Bergheim gods and may it long continue. No one, except those lucky enough to get in, knows what it looks like on the inside. That is, until now. I will show you what is inside the world's most notorious oh, nightclub. So cool. I'll show you. Most Bergheimers hate this sort of stuff though. There's some purists out there that hate people talking about the inside of the club. And this. it's like, come on, get over yourself. Like, it's already very well, it's already very well looked after by the community, considering the scale of it, considering how big it is, considering the amount of people that go through their doors, considering the amount of business they do. It's pretty impressive how they've been able to keep it close to its underground roots. It's impossible to keep it underground because it's the most famous club in the world. But the fact that it's still fairly you know, under wraps, it's still, you know, no photos, people, and, you know, the, the first time I ever went to Bergheim, I remember being on the dance floor and basically um, being told off by somebody not to do drugs on the dance floor, being said, no, you don't do that here, we, that's not what we do, because, you know, London, UK vibes, you just do everything on the dance floor, quick bump, quick pill, whatever, and that was the first time, okay, shit, it's not, this is not the way they do things here, and then you start to learn more, do your research, watch your documentaries, but... They do a good job at keeping on the wraps, but some fans are like really against this sort of stuff. So I'm curious to see what they think of this documentary or this little clip. What's inside Barakai? Sophie is a 23 year old German who grew up in Bavaria. She doesn't speak to her mother, but she does stay in contact with her Volkswagen employed father. A year ago, she moved to Berlin to pursue a career as an artist. Oh yeah. She works mostly at cafes though. Her backpack is filled with multiple outfits. Some who get into Bergheim stay for days. For Sophie, her bag is a tool, a signal to the strictest bouncers in the world that she's no amateur. It's cold in her fishnets. The line starts to move. In 1949, Berlin was separated by ideology between East and West. Their visions on urban planning divided too. The Second World War destroyed homes. New ones had to be built, and both sides wanted to flex. I speak, of course, of West Berlin, a huge, vibrant city with its great main road, comparable in breath and luxury of its stores to our Champs Elysees. In the West, the center became the Breitscheidplatz, the Kurfürstendamm, its most attractive boulevard. Shops where you can find everything cafes, restaurants that are always full, and especially at night. In the East, it became Alexanderplatz, and right next to it, the East German elites planned the construction of a grand new socialist boulevard, the Stalin Allee. The Stalin Allee is the Grundstein des Aufbaus zum Sozialismus 
in der Hauptstadt Deutschlands, Berlin. The first socialist street in East Germany. It would increase the amount of homes and try to advertise the strength of socialism through concrete and mortar. It also created Berghain. Regel 1. Die Stadt als Siedlungsform ist nicht zufällig entstanden. In the 1950s, the DDR adopts the 16 principles of urban design, a lesson on urban planning from a Russian parent to a German child. Das Ziel des Städtebaus ist die harmonische Befriedigung des menschlichen Anspruchs auf Arbeit, Wohnung, Kultur und Erholung. The Soviets said that organized housing blocks should be built first, so the East Germans did. They built six to seven story tall buildings with restaurants, movie theaters, and other amenities. This was a time when the refrigerator was a symbol for luxury. The apartments in Stalin Alley had space built for them. Uh, Regel 7. Bei Städten, die an einem Fluss liegen, ist eine der Hauptadern und die architektonische Achse der Fluss mit seinen Uferstraßen. The Soviets said to build parallel next to water. The Stalin Alley was. Die vielgeschossige Bauweise ist wirtschaftlicher als die ein- oder zweigeschossige. Sie entspricht auch dem Charakter der Großstadt. The Boulevard was built with public transportation, modern amenities, and with restaurants and worker buildings. But the Stalin Alley needed one more thing to complete it. A plant to power it. In 1953, the DDR constructs a heating plant. One of the It's 30 one of, in the morning. Oops. One of the amazing things about Berghain is that this building's been around, obviously, since forever. And they haven't never knocked it down. It's now become a, you know, it's a cultural heritage thing. It's protected by loads of, you know, amazing things. So it's never going to go anywhere anytime soon. But in London, that's prime real estate. That would be turned into like another soulless co-working space made out of fucking glass and metal with shitty cafe shops around it and whatnot. And big fucking chairs with fucking donuts on their fucking Apple laptops looking at their emails all day. So the fact that this building just exists is already a testament to how unique and one-off that city is because it does, I don't think that would exist in any other city in, in Europe where such a prime real estate would be just given to a nightclub to do what they want. It doesn't exist. Sophie is closer. She's at a point in the line where her vibe of depressed art student will be vital in getting her in. Yeah, man. If she even gives off the slightest hint that her father sends her more than a thousand euros each month, <laughs> her chances will be ruined. This queue, honestly, is so funny. If you've ever been to Bergen, you'll know. When you're at the end of the queue, It's really chatty. People are sharing cigarettes, maybe sharing some drogas, some drinks. People are, you know, saying, hey, do you want anything? And they'll go to the fucking thing and buy a drink there if you want something. People are talking, sharing rave experiences, rave stories, war stories. The moment it gets to close, the moment you get close to the barriers, suddenly everybody collectively goes quiet. <laughs> <laughs> you all start like playing it cool like you don't really want to be there you know you just happen to bump in you just happen to be in the area so you just join the queue whatever you don't want to care you make eye contact with the bouncers or you don't and or sometimes what people would do silently in your head you start to judge who's getting in and who's not getting in you're like oh shit he got in or she you know he didn't get in and he looks way cooler than me you start getting nervous you're like fuck oh those group of girls didn't get in either and they're super cool and you start thinking you're worried And suddenly you're like, oh, sh and then I think what happens, closer you get to the door, you start to realize, okay, there's no, there's no pattern to this. It's just random. There is no like figuring out who, why they got in, why they didn't get in. It's just luck. So you just let it go. You get to the front, let the guy look at you. And then you hope that they wave you inside. You hope, <laughs> you hope. Sometimes you can be lucky and they can ask you, hey, do you know who's playing? And then if you're smart and you did your research, you'll know, you'll name some people. Um, I think the only time that I got grilled is when one time they said, oh, have you been there before? I said, like, yeah, yeah, I've been there before. And I said, yeah, I was here last for the, for the, for the Sylvester in July. And, I, and, and you know how desperate I was? This is something I'm only going to admit on here. I won't ever admit it anywhere else. I'll admit it here to you guys in secret. One time I got asked when I got to the burger in front door, hey, do you know who's playing tonight? I was like, yeah. You've been here before? I was like, yeah. And then I mentioned when I've been here before without them asking me. I offered it up. I was like, yeah, I was here at the Sylvester. And then as I was saying it, I took out my phone and I had the picture saved that I took of the wristband. When I got back to my Airbnb, I was like drunk and I took a picture of my wristband, like to be cool. I then had it saved in the, I had it saved in my favorites album on my iPhone. I, I got it and I up students showed it straight away. Like, yeah, look, see, I've been here before. <laughs> so corny, so lame, so cringe. 
But guess what? I got in, so it so it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. Right in front of her is a group of loud British men, equipped with puffy North Face jackets and piles of makeup that happen to come with a British girl attached. Oh yeah, that's when sometimes one of the sad things about Bergheim, though, sometimes you're in a queue and you bump into a group of people, and you know they're not going to get in, but you don't have the guts. It's not really your place. And you feel awkward to kind of say to them, hey, you better just leave. Especially if you're waiting for a long time. You're like, you know what? You might as well go somewhere else. You're not going to get in. But you don't You don't want to say it. So, so you just leave it. It's really it's really sad. Especially if they're in front of you. You're like, oh, man. I know you're definitely not going to get in. But there's been there's been some times where I've been in the queue with people who I thought would never get in. And I see them in a the club. I'm like, shit, how the fuck did you get in? You were fucked. You were like swaying. You were sleeping on the floor. Like, how the fuck did you get in? So it's just luck sometimes. It's just luck. I think... If I'm being critical of Bergheim for one second, which I don't ever do because I fucking love the place, but if I'm being critical of it, I'd say one thing I think they should do is that maybe they should do, especially when it's really busy, if it's like a special event, if it's like a public holiday, if it's like an Easter thing, if it's like a fucking New Year's, New Year's, Day, New Year's Day thing, whatever else, right? When obviously all the tourists come, I think it'll be beneficial if they had some, because they used to do this in the past. I remember in the past, one time I went to Bergheim when it was really busy. I think it was like a, special event and i was waiting in the queue for like four plus hours and shit they would come down the queue and just say no 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 maybe i mean they, they would just tell you to go before you even got to the door so do you wouldn't waste your time and i think they should do that more often like instead of just let, making you queue for four hours and then you get to the front and you don't get in at least give people who are never going to get in the chance to just go and do something else and not waste their time but you know it's not really a waste of time because it's all an experience in itself. Do you know what I mean? Meeting people, seeing the people coming in and out. And because it's a 24-hour plus city, it's not as if you're wasting your time because the other clubs are not going to close soon. Do you know what I mean? They're still going to close on Monday anyway. So maybe it's a to and fro and, you know, whatever. Who knows? Good, Sophie thinks to herself. The Brits will be rejected. Yeah, Koila. Koila asks, is there a walker... Sh- um, how early do you get in line? Um, It depends. People have two, there's two schools of thoughts here about early. Because Berkheim officially is open from Saturday night all the way to Monday morning. That's when it's officially open, the whole building. Um, so there's a school of thought that says you shouldn't go at Saturday night. At, you should ever either go at Saturday night when it opens at 11 p.m. or I think 12, right? Close to about, about 11.55 p.m. it opens. You should either queue up really early and see if you can get in in the early flow and sneak in that way. Or the suggestion that you should come early in the morning on Saturday morning. So you should come between the hours of like 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. Or you should come in the afternoon and the hours of 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. So you can kind of miss the... Because basically what you want to do, you want to avoid miss... You want to avoid all of the rush of people leaving other clubs at like you know, six in the morning to get there. You want to kind of miss that gap because there's usually a gap in the middle where it's usually kind of empty and you, so there's no queue. And then usually that time when they kind of change bounces, there's a possibility you could probably get in easier that way. Um, so that's usually a time. And, you know, you could always, I think the best way to do it is also to check out that Instagram account, which is Berghain Live. And I think the, obviously the Reddit, the Berghain Community Reddit is the best place because they're always updating people and saying, oh yeah, the queue is this long. And obviously there's loads of Telegram groups too. Just search on Telegram. You'll be able to find Telegram groups of people i think the main one that i'm on is like bergheim music lovers or something and they always kind of update you on the queue times but the queue times i think it's best to go really early in the morning or really early in the afternoon those are the best times to go because usually people are like in bed or something so usually the best time to go then in an instant the bouncers will be more likely to accept a familiar german after when the berlin wall fell east berlin became a shell. and there isn't no and there isn't i don't think quite as well the, 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 there isn't a walk of shame because it's so hard to get into, I don't think anybody feels bad if they don't get in. It's just annoying you waste your time. I don't think it's like a shame thing. It's just you just like you really wanted to go. Like you're you're always you're out there. You can hear the music from the outside. You see all these cool people coming in and out. You might see if you're the DJ you want to see come in with their record bags. So it's just frustrating that you don't get in. I don't think it's a walk of shame. You just, you know, it kind of is what it is. And usually I don't know about other people, but I know with me, even though I've got in all the time that I've got there by myself, um, I think even when I go by myself, I always have like backup plans. I'm like, okay, if I don't get in, I know exactly where I'm going to go next. So it's not like you're like, oh my God, this is my only place I want to go. The leftover buildings in the East became abandoned breeding grounds for techno. 
in Berlin in den 90er, wo man sich leere Räume genommen und Where people spielte. took empty rooms and played ja, in them and then left them again at some point. So eine Art a kind of squatter ethos. Und das galt ja auch and that also applied to Osgood, which was a factory building in the middle of nowhere. Look at the, look at the, look at the original, the original signage of Berghain. That's Berlin's most important. Panorama Bar, Osgood, Laboratory, Berlin Friedestein. What's that say? Music, music. Kun Tag Lag Tong. Honestly, German language is a fucking nightmare to fucking try and learn. The, look how long that was. What does that even mean? Does that mean like music center or something? Music Kun, music Kunter Hau Tung. Music Kunter Hau Tung. Like fucking hell. So many words. Horton K Club. Run by Michael Tufel and Norbert Dormann. It was a place oh, for a different type of early, protection early. and different types of behavior. But in 2003, it had to close. Mm -hmm. The city had set its sights on a brand new stadium. Oskut's owners had to find a new empty building. Sophie can see the bouncer. The Brits are the only thing standing between her and entering Berghain. This is a nervous place in front of them so is a man nervous. named Sven. Not someone you'd want to argue with. Tonight he'll have to fight the fragile male British ego. You know what's funny? Sven is actually the nicest bouncer. He's actually the nicest. He actually gives people a chance. He'll talk to people like, there's other bouncers at Bergheim who are way more ruthless and cutthroat with their nose and it seems like they take like, you know, they take pride in telling you to fuck off. Yeah. Sven is uh, actually, Sven, despite what he looks like, hey, all right. with the tattoos all over his face, Sven's actually way nicer. Mate, guten tag, mein friend. Heute nicht. James, what does he mean? Heute nicht. Mate, are you taking the mickey? We've been waiting out here for fucking hours. Do you mean we should come back at night? The British men were pulled away by two bouncers. Sophie became excited. I've never seen it happen, by the way. When people get turned away, they usually just leave. I've never seen people argue and fight, usually. Um, the only people I've seen actually fight and argue are the girls. Usually, it's oddly, odd to say this, right? But it's usually Russian girls or Ukrainian girls, like especially the rich ones. They'll come in there and they'll start recording inside a club. And obviously, you're not allowed to do that. It's, it's, it's like a no... It's like a um, it's like a zero tolerance policy with recording in there. They cover your phone. They tell you you can't record in there. If you get caught recording, you get chucked out straight away. And I've seen you know Russian girls especially. They just love. They just argue. Oh my god, I paid money. I didn't know why I can't. It's my social media. Blah, blah, blah. It's such a. It's like how do you not know this is the one of the main rules of this place? Like, have you done no research? It's pretty funny to be fair. That happens. You see them all the time. Big up, big up the big up my my Russian and Ukrainian itches out there who don't give a fuck about rules too excited. She composed herself and made herself think about the banality of existence, and then about how her thinking about that made her edgy and cool, producing the perfect combination of facial muscles that could get her into the club. It was her turn now. Sven was in front of her. Sven began working for Oskud. The strict door policy he helps administer is not just a marketing tactic, it's necessary. Ich habe die Verantwortung, dass Berghain zu einem sicheren Ort für Menschen zu machen, make Berghain a safe place for people who come purely to enjoy the music and celebrate. To keep people away from the prying eyes of adults who were once kids that told on others in elementary school, Sven protects those who would be told on. See, he looks really menacing, right? He's got these cool piercings on his lips and uh, this cool horn septum and these big rings and his ears and plugs and tattoos all over his face. He looks menacing. I think the tattoo is like barbed wire. But I swear to God, he's the nicest bouncer. The other ones are the ones to watch out for. The other ones are the ones that are like harder to get in with. They're really harsh. Sven's actually, he actually might ask you, hey, who are you here to see? He might ask you some, like whatever. He'll just like, you know, he'll be a bit more personable. It's the, the other ones you have to watch out for. That's, that's what I like about that place. Like it's the ones you don't expect are the harshest. <laughs> so be in your P's and Q's. But Sven's actually quite nice. Der Club hat sich aus der Berliner the club Schule evolved to the gay scene in Bergen in the 90s. The importance of that, we preserve some of that heritage. But it still feels like a welcoming place for the original sort of club around. To get through Sven and his team of bouncers, there are many unspoken rules. Oh yeah, that's that. That's the that's the logo that's on the book as well. Um, what's that book? I swear I've got it still. It's like the it's like the EasyJet. I think it's a book about techno tourism. I read it ages ago. I think it's like EasyJet Techno or something. I forgot what it's called. Is it EasyJet Techno? Let's see if I can find it. It's, it's a book by this writer that rip. Well, but obviously the the boom people going around and fucking doing the techno tourism shit that I did. But if you know, you know. People think you should follow. Be in a small group. Wear black look bored and somewhat indifferent, do not speak, 
and have spoken to speak German. But these rules... By the way, I don't speak German and I don't always wear black when I go in there and I get in. So some of these rules are dumb. You just got to like, you know, you just got to try your luck really. It's not anything. Just kind of... Be, I, I think you're better off being yourself. I see people go there with fucking um, harnesses on, with their nails painted, with makeup on their face. Clearly, it's not what they do in their regular life and they look clearly like they're wearing a, a, a fucking... A, what do you call it, an, a uniform or an outfit or a costume it doesn't look congruent to who they are whatsoever and you could smell them you could see them from a mile away so you're better off just wearing what you would regularly wear in your own city to go and party and just try your luck but the idea of like wearing a particular gut it's not you're talking okay, no it doesn't guarantee like i've worn all white there i've worn color it doesn't matter man you just whatever it's just just luck thing and by the way the book itself if you're wondering is called lost and sound um it's called lost and sound by a guy called tobias rap i've actually got it somewhere here actually i read it back in the day it's a really good one um it, the, the blurb is almost everyone in the world knows someone who has been to german capital and proudly returned with bizarre stories of the previously unimagined highs of the endless techno parties in Bergheim, watergate or trezor all these stories contain a grain of truth but many questions remain unanswered why is it thousands of clubbing tourists land in berlin schoenfeld airport every weekend why have the clubs in Bergheim come to become stuff of legends and why have some of the best known producers and techno djs like richie hilton and dj hell moved with their labels to the city these are the kind of questions explored in lost and sound by tobias rap a german journalist music journalist who's been living and working in berlin um, since the 90s has spoken with djs and clubbers and labels and hotel managers and urban planners he has looked at listened carefully so check it out it's a really good book lost and sound it's quintessential for those of you who are into this whole techno tourism nightlife dance scene techno shit that i'm into check it out it's a really good book really aren't that black and white Getting into bear kind comes down fundamentally to a vibe. Sophie's identity was crafted through years of not eating enough by a distant, emotionally unavailable workaholic parent and an arts education filled with regret. Tonight, her vibe is enough. Sven nods and lets her pass. As Sophie enters, she hears the droning sound of a PC. She thinks to herself, Am I in an ad? When making these videos, there are lots of times oh, where I wish I could. Boo, boo, ad, 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 ad. It's a European company. It's secure. It has a 99. Skip, skip, skip. Day. It's changed how I work. Try out AnyDesk at anydesk.com slash who. When we speak of Barrakine, we are mainly speaking about this section. There's also the Hulle which is a much larger chamber that's on the backside of the building. But this oh, is that how you pronounce it? Hala. I think you pronounce it how. Jesus Christ. It's pronounced Hala. Hala. Okay, fair play. This area is more publicly accessible and does not have a cult following surrounding it. When we speak of Berghain, we're actually talking about four floors, each with separate clubs mm. located here. So good. The most recently opened club is called Soile, located on the ground floor. That's a really cool one. The Berghain dance floor is on the main floor, and then there's the Panorama Bar, located on the top floor. My favorite room has to be Panorama Bar, and obviously the XXX. I hope they talk about the XXX room, but Pano is my favorite. The house, probably one of the best house rooms ever in the world, has to be. Best programming, great vibe. Um, you know, espresso martinis at the back there. There's a there's there's a there's a bartender in that in Pano room in Pano Bar. Um, the bartender there is notoriously very hard <laughs> to make smile or he's just he's a bit of a hard ass but I love it I love the I love the unpredictability of like whether or not you're going to get him happy or sad or whatever but I love it all Panorama Bar is definitely my favourite place to go in Berghain is where they play techno music which is open from Saturday evening until Monday Ooh, it's stairs the Panorama up. Bar so on the cool. other hand is for lighter house music yeah the last and fifth place is the male exclusive Laboratory it has a separate, more mysterious entrance at the side of the building, which goes to the basement of Berghain. In the main building, there are also dark rooms for play. But the Hold on, so it's Laboratory XXX room. That's the one I went into during the club, well, during the, um, what do you call it? During the Sylvester. It's the place where the DJ booth is like in a cage. It's suspended. It's like you have to walk, walk up some stairs instead of a cage at the top. And there's like platforms everywhere to stand on really high ones. It's an amazing room. 
So I guess that's actually the laboratory. Okay, I didn't know that. Fucking hell. The lab is the more exclusive and restricted location. On one hand, you need niches and retreat spaces. Humans, cave dwellers, like tight spaces. On the other hand, you need free movement areas that allow you to cruise smoothly. And rooms where guests can present themselves. Exactly. Sometimes Berghain and the lab are connected via Soile, and only men are admitted to the entire building. But the majority of times, it's separate. The betreiber wanted a club which they would not have to share. Neither with the building authorities nor the fire protection. The interior was designed by Studio Carhart, who had to navigate a fine line between maximizing freedom while minimizing chaos. A club is like a kindergarten. You have to expect the unexpected. In the gitteros in the way in Bergheim about have, sind die Löcher entweder so klein, so small that you can't put your finger in them. Or so big that it doesn't, doesn't get stuck. Bleibt. Ah, okay, smart. Für die Böden Smoothly ground asphalt for the floors, der lässt sich fugenlos einbauen. which can be installed seamlessly and, and is resistant to Bergheim has an ice cream bar, multiple normal ones, dark rooms, and large units. That's the one place I've never been to. The one place I've never been to whilst I've been in there is the ice cream bar. I never actually ordered an ice cream. I think next time I go, I'm going to make a mission to go there because I've never been. I usually just, I mean, the room's gone up and down and in and out of the toilets, but I've never been in a fucking ice cream bar. I've never had the luxury or had the pleasure of eating an ice cream and having a break up there. The sex bathrooms. There's also sometimes an opening to a garden on the outside. Yeah, the garden's really cool. Berghain, haben the Berghain was raised the railings on the stairs. True. Um, that already existed by several centimeters and rounded the handrails. That's a really good point. This, the, the, the handrails on the stairs, the side of them, they're oddly high. You basically can't see over the edge unless you like peer over. So I guess it's to stop people like getting too high and drunk and fucking falling over because it's pretty, you know, substantial stairs. It's quite high up. Um, but yeah, that's pretty cool. I just, I missed the, I missed the statue. Back in the day when I went, there used to be a statue. When you walked into the main room, there'd be this almost like floor to ceiling high statue of like a guy. It's like a, like a Rome, I don't know what it was. It was like a statue. And it was fucking cool to come in and see that. It literally felt like it was in some fucking cyberpunk movie or something. It was fucking cool. But I don't know why they took it down. Metal and walls and railings extend down to the ground. To prevent bottles that have been knocked over from falling down. The bar counters are not particularly edgy. And in many passages, we have created opportunities to learn or sit comfortably. For a club that is based on exclusivity and secrecy, it needs to be safe enough so that it can protect itself from having to be opened up to the outside. Nobody should collapse in the toilets and must be found until a muddy lunchtime. Yeah, by the way, they have one of the best toilets ever. All the toilets are fucking amazing. I think at the moment, they're trying to push that toilet downstairs on the main floor, on the ground floor. Next, on the way to go to the garden, there's a toilet there. They're trying to make that a flinter only toilet. So I guess that's like female, lesbian, intersex, trans, and well, I don't know what the A stands for. And they're trying to make that only like a toilet for that community of people. And I think there's now another petition to make a toilet that's only for shitting and pissing. Because a lot of people, you know, myself included, are in that toilet fucking, you know, bumping and pilling up until the heart's content. And sometimes if you've been in there, especially with friends, you turn the toilets into a fucking little youth club and you end up just chatting away and just or whatever. Or people are banging or whatever. But so if you're actually wanting to piss and shit, you're like waiting for ages, especially when it's really busy. So they're trying to, you know, figure out what toilet could be like the strict. You're only piss and shit here. No druggers, no hanky panky. But it's hard, isn't it? Because, you know, how are you going to police that? You know what I mean? We have some steel doors for the rubber because the people waiting outside are banging on them and their fists and finally get in. Ah, oh, very smart. Well, there are already a four people in the cubicle. Okay, the club should be functioning instinctively. That means that there are hardly any dead ends. You can find your way out every corner. That's a good point. There are very little dead ends. Every time you feel there's a dead end, there's another door. Or another way to go back around. You don't really feel like you hit a wall. Shit, all intentional. The toilet pieces are also designed so that you can walk in the circles around. Their kind may be exclusive because it's good for marketing. It might have an air of secrecy so that more people try and get in. But at this point, it should be clear to you that what's inside is underwhelming to explain. Exactly. I can show you a floor plan, you have to stainless steel bathroom, exactly, exactly. and a Stalinist exactly, facade. Exactly. But I can't make you smell the sweat, uh -huh. hear the droning sound of techno, uh -huh. or feel the comfort some find within its walls. Berghain was a fortress born from a time of authoritarian restriction. 
Today, its rules remain to protect a place beyond definition. That's why I think it's important that people take Bergheim as like an example, not because of copying exactly what they do, but just the ethos around it. Because I feel like it represents something that doesn't exist nowadays where everybody thinks the most expensive, the most glitzy, the most crazy produced thing is always the best thing. At its core, it's just a rectangular concrete block. And it's just all the things they put in place to make it what it is, like the no foe policy, the really great booking and programming, the inclusivity of it, how people, you know, how it's, meant, how it's basically, you know, uh, founded from that, you know, the gay scene and shit. And it's, it's meant to be a more of a safe haven for them. And it's obviously kind of been born out to be a little bit more overexpanded in that regard. All those things are why it's successful. It's not really about the building. It's not really about even the location. And I think you could easily take some of those, that, that DNA, that ethos, and I've sprinkle it into what you're doing. Because I think some clubs around the world fail in that they try and copy what Bergheim are doing and try and, you know, make it work where they are, which is obviously isn't going to work because Bergheim also part, primarily works because it's in Berlin, because of, you know, their approach or how seriously they take fucking club music and dance music and nightlife and shit. All those things kind of lend to it being successful. But I think at its core, the fact that it's not glitzy, the fact that they don't have, you know, Wi-Fi in there, all this type of crazy shit... That's what people should be taking as like, a, okay, cool. It's possible to recreate this in my own way by taking the ethos of like, okay, let's make this club where it's more important about experiencing it at, while you're there. There's no recording. There's no video, no this and that. Um, everybody kind of collectively polices each other. Um, there's no overbearing security on the dance floor. If anything, you hardly, sometimes the security does go around and patrol, but you hardly feel them around. They don't flash flashlights around. They're not overbearing. They're almost kind of just like, you know, just carefully just make sure everyone's cool, everyone's good. The toilet kind of culture thing is amazing. No one gets super fucked up on the dance floor. You'd never see fights in there ever. Um, all that stuff can easily be recreated in other places. So I think that's an important part of it and why it should exist and why it does exist and why people should take lessons from it. But don't just, you know, don't apply it too literally because unfortunately that place only works in Berlin. Channel. Whoops. Consider checking out it the wouldn't work in It wouldn't work in any other place, I think, in my opinion. But regardless, amazing video. Big up Hog, the channel. Great video. It's called What's Inside the World's Most Exclusive Club. Check it out. It's fucking amazing. I loved watching every minute of that video thank you for sharing hog